All right, so before I start, let me uh, announce that there will be one of the students' talks at 3.30 after the coffee break on the distribution of K3 numbers. All right, and I will continue, so my kind of trying to point out some highlights of this uh, method to get exponential distribution beyond one half um, for the von Mangold function. So let me remind you of the kind of goal we have. Um, so we are looking at Q square free up to uh, one half plus something strictly positive. Now I won't write any explicit constant because it's not important for the goal. It's square free and it's, uh, okay, so let's call it delta one. And it's X delta smooth. So we want a positive delta one, but the small delta, we don't care about what it is as long as for, for some delta one, if there's a even infinitesimally small delta that works, then it's fine. And now we can, in fact, put an absolute value. And then we have SQA minus psi of x over phi of q. And we want to gain x over log x to the a, uh, where the implied constant is allowed to depend on delta 1, delta, and a, but it's crucial for the application, we have in mind that it is independent of small a. That's the goal. So what I'm going to say will be quite far from giving really a sketch of the proof, but I hope that some at least of the main ideas will, will appear. So we saw this uh, type of uh, linear form decomposition. can uh, reduce, oh, yeah, it's really multilinear to, um, so multilinear expressions, which are really something like the sum of the same type of Qs. So I, I won't repeat always all the condition. Let me incorporate the condition together with the absolute value by saying that I multiply by something which is of modulus bounded by one. So, so in this case, literally, you would take C of Q to be the characteristic function of this times the sign of the difference. So this is a way of getting rid of the absolute value sign, uh, which is a common tactic in this game. Uh, so already there in the fourier vanietz papers, for instance. And then, um, Then we have replaced, after multilinear for the compositions, the psi x q a minus psi of x over phi of q with some kind of uh, complicated expressions with maybe uh, nj variables. So let me take the type that comes up from uh, Isbrand's identity. So the m's, I think, was what I used for the short ones. Let me try and at least be consistent. And so the short one. So the M's are very short. So uh, there was a remark that was made by a student after the first talk. So the small j, I tended to write everything as if the total number of variables was always the maximum number. Uh, that's not a problem because uh, we always have the same constraint on the length of the short variable. So the fact that there's a varying number of these actually makes no difference. Uh, and it's always in applications that I know when you have the maximum number of short variables that you have to do the most work. But let's do as if we allow to have an arbitrary uh, number of variables less than capital J. Then we have some alpha one. Uh, did I use alpha or beta for the M's? This I think was less. Okay, I'll just use alpha for the long, uh, for the short ones. And beta for the long. For so these are smooth, these are kind of rough things. And uh, now there's going to be some kind of expected main term. So it's customary to not worry too much about the main term at this level and assume that by some kind of uh, harmonic analysis like Poisson summation formula, like yesterday, it will arise naturally from 
uh, some of the terms in the Poisson f summation formula, so we don't have to repeat it all the time. And so then the constraint is that the product of the n's times the product of the m's uh, is less than or equal to x. Uh, and they are, actually that's not the most important, I want this to be congruent to a mod q. Okay, with the ni's of size capital ni, mi of size capital mi, and the product of the n's times product of the j's is essentially the same as x. Okay, so again, there are things one would do to typically, uh, when the products of these is much less than x by a large power of log x, you can handle trivially anyway. Uh, it also, that probably will not be so obvious from what I say, but q on x to be also very close to square root of x, simply because if q is less than square root of x divided by large power, you can use Bombier if you don't cut off anyway. So q is really quite close to x to the one half. But it can be a little bit beyond x to the one half. And the alphas are bounded essentially by one. And so kind of the trivial bound for this type of sum is always uh, of size essentially x, and we need to gain a big power of log x. And so the idea is to do gluing of variables to uh, do as much as possible with bilinear forms, which are the most, uh, the best understood of these expressions. And so here's the type of lemma that Zhang uses. To do this, so I'll just state it and explain quickly how it's done so that you see at least once in, in like on the blackboard the type of stuff that goes in. So it's a combinatorial lemma, and then we're going to translate these combinatorics into uh, fixing the lengths of the variables and gluing according to these lengths. So we're going to take an integer n at least one. So in the case above, this is the total number of variables, so 2j. And we have uh, n parameters, t1, tn, with the sum equal to 1. Okay, And you should think that uh, the variables are of length x to the power uh, ti. Okay, So sum ti equals 1 means that the total length of the variable is essentially x. And then uh, we're going to do gluings, which means we, we need to look at subsets, sums of the subsets, where uh, some favorable condition holds. And then the statement says the following, so one of the following is true. So this is the original version of Jean, essentially. So there's an extra parameter which I should put select here. So this parameter is a real number between 1 over 10 and 1 half, which is fixed to begin with. You can think of sigma, let's say, is 1 over 6. Um, that's the type of stuff that will arise. So the situations can be the following. So sum, so 1 of the ti is relatively large. And by large, we mean 1 half plus sigma. So what does this mean in terms of this type of interpretation? This means one of the single variables, so 1t corresponds to a single one of these 2j variables, has lengths la longer than square root of x by a non-trivial amount, because it's at least 1 tenth. So in particular, if j is large enough, this means it's not one of the complicated ones. It has to be one of the long, smooth ones. Okay, And this is favorable because if you have a long, smooth variable, you can gain cancellation from that variable only by Poisson summation, typically. And treat trivially the other ones, because it's a little bit, quite a bit beyond 1 half, uh, even a small gain from this long variable is enough to go well beyond uh, x in the, in the bound. Okay, yeah? So the x could be 1 over j, that's all the same, right? Yeah, the m's are less than, yeah. So this, yeah. Yeah, only the n's are less than x1 over j. The n's are the smooth ones. Maybe I should write it here again for, so beta is smooth. And alpha is arbitrary, but small size. I mean, it's not actually arbitrary, but essentially one knows it. OK, the second possibility. So this, in, in all cases, is something that one feels is easy to handle. That's an easy case. 
when we translate that into sums. The second case is there's a fairly good bilinear de uh, decomposition. So there exists, uh, okay, so there exists a decomposition of the variables disjoint Okay, so it means a gluing of the two J variables into two groups to make a bilinear form, where somehow the lengths from each of the two gluings is relatively close to each other, and which means they are relatively close to X to one F. So precisely that's where the parameter sigma also comes in. So the smaller of the lengths, let's say, comes from S. That's, of course, a question of ordering if you want S to be larger than T or not. And it's like that. Okay. So this corresponds to bilinear forms, which are relatively well balanced. Okay. So uh, not completely balanced to the point that m is equal to n, like the lengths of the two gluings are the same, but by an amount that can be relatively small. Okay. And now the third case is the uh, the case that. Uh, remains in the original version of Zhang. Uh, one can give examples where it's not true that uh, one of one or two is always the case. There could be a last possibility, which is that there exist three variables um, distinct with, OK, so the corresponding lengths are not too small, so at least two sigma and also not too large. OK, so this is just we're ordering the three lengths. That's no problem. And uh, none of the two sums is small. So if you take the product of any two of these three variables, each of them is at least 1 half plus sigma. OK. Now, before I explain what this means, let me give a small exercise that you can think about. Is that if uh, sigma is larger than 1, 6, 3 does not happen. OK. And that's completely easy just by playing with these inequalities. So let me now recall the interpretation. So I already said some of this by words. I'll repeat it at the same time as I write something. So one uh, means uh, so one uh, smooth variable of length significantly larger than scope of x, and then you can get uh, get cancellation just from that one by Poisson summation. Uh, and cancellation means there might be a main term that will just be eliminated by the expected main term thing that I'm not writing all the time. By OK, so it's a variant of Poisson summation. It's not quite the same I gave yesterday. So the variant, when you do this type of long sums, uh, if you have a sum of lengths x, uh, on the dual side, you will get something of, uh, if you have a sum of lengths, let's say capital N, it will be replaced by a sum of essentially lengths X over N. And so if one smooth variable has lengths significantly larger than scope of X, it will be transformed into a sh shorter sum that you estimate trivially and you've gained the difference in the X to the one half. So here you get very good cancellation. And this is easy. There's no, essentially there's no arithmetic in that case. Okay. The second case means, uh, so the two glued variables mn, well, of lengths, so m is the product, uh, so it's going to be the shorter one, let's say, so it's the product of x to the ti for i in s, and n is the other one. So give a fairly well balanced uh, 
bilinear form. Okay. Uh, and in particular, uh, because the length is not too short, it's well distributed, it's not very difficult to deduce from the ziegel valfish theorem that they will be quite well distributed to very small moduli. So in other words, there's not going to be a problem with small moduli because everything here is big enough. So, so it will not be particularly clear why this ziegel valfish property is important, but it does play a role in these arguments. So well distributed. So the, these two, the uh, alpha and beta you obtain by gluing, are well distributed to small moduli. So that's what's called often the ziegel valfish property uh, extended from the form Mongol function to some arbitrary asthmatic function. This is like asking uh, strong uniform bounds for moduli in arithmetic progression to moduli less than from arbitrary power of log x. Okay, and the last inter integration of the last step. So the crucial thing uh, that one sees from, if you take these three inequalities that tells you that any two of the variables glued together are relatively big, if you sum, uh, you see that uh, ti plus tj plus tk is at least uh, three quarter plus three sigma over two. So you sum uh, twice each of them, and together this gives you uh, twice the sum, and it's at least uh, three half plus three sigma. So this means uh, we get uh, something of the following type. So sum of, uh, okay, let me remind myself. So the betas are the smooth ones. So you'll have one beta, uh, one second beta and a third beta of lengths x to the uh, ti, x to the tj, x to the tk. That's the length. Then we glue everything else together to some alpha, which is uh, not well controlled, so not smooth. And we have to sum this over n, congruent to a mod q and then over, over Q. Uh, so this, the point is, uh, because these are smooth, so yeah, the betas are smooth because the TIs are at least two sigma, uh, and sigma is at least one ten. so if you take uh, enough variables in the East Brown identity, uh, it cannot be that these are one of the M's because the M's would correspond to a T that's less than one over J. So you need uh, one over J to be less than two sigma. Okay, so here you think that this is uh, one over j, and j was uh, n equals two j, so j is n naught, something like that. So we have smooth functions, and then we take the triple convolution, and then some kind of little noise, but the not smooth is still fairly short, quite short. Okay. Uh, as we saw here, so we at least have three quarter plus uh, three uh, fifths, since sigma is at least one over 10, I guess three over 20, sorry. So that's uh, quite long, okay? well beyond uh, x to the one half, and in fact, quite a bit beyond x to the three quarter. So this looks very much like a ternary divisor function in arithmetic progressions. Uh, it's not quite long enough for the smooth terms that you could just apply straightforwardly what uh, Friedland or Ivani has proved for the ternary divisor function, because the, uh, the length here is still a bit too long, but uh, you can certainly feel that this is a pretty, pretty nice situation, uh, especially because there's a, this extra average over Q. So the Friedland or Ivaniet's theorem for, primes, for ternary divisor function is a strong exponent of distribution. So it does not need any averaging, any smoothness or anything, so the fact that you have extra averaging uh, possible multiplicative structure of the modulus and so on is a very nice uh, and uh, certainly uh, can give you hope. So, so this is similar to a ternary divisor function. OK, 
Okay, and indeed, so Zhang had to make some acrobatics to, to deal with that, but in the polymatate version, there's uh, a treatment of this that's more streamlined uh, based on this paper by uh, Fouvry, uh, Philippe Michel and myself, where this is really kind of uh, not particularly hard. So, okay. And in fact, so again, in the polymatite project, uh, it was shown that when you apply this to, uh, when you estimate the, the sums of type, uh, the bilinear forms, you can even do it with sigma larger than 1, 6. So whatever the underlying estimates that you need to, to handle these things can be done with sigma 3 larger than 1, 6, which means that in fact you don't need to deal with that. So the crucial thing is, uh, from this point of view, this is what we need to handle. So we need to handle bilinear forms uh, over residue classes uh, when both lengths are relatively close to one half, and we need to get a non-trivial estimate allowing uh, lengths which are moduli, which is a little bit larger than x to one half. Okay, so I'm going to concentrate on two. So we try to get So as good as possible. So meaning we have the sum over two variables. Let's say m is of size m, n is of size n, alpha m, beta n. And now we just have mn congruent to a mod q. And then the same sum of same conditions minus some expected mate. Okay, the trivial bound is still essentially of size mn, and the goal is still to get something that's a little bit uh, better by uh, power of log, power of log x. So mn is about x, and q is relatively close to x to the one half, but can be a bit larger in logarithmic scale, and that's the key point. But it's it's also not too small. So we have good control of the size of the variables, which is a important often to control uh, the progress. Okay, so I'm not proving this lemma. Uh, this is fairly elementary combinatorics. This is just to give an idea of how this is one identity can be applied. Okay, and I'm also not giving more details on how one handles case one. And I will probably not have time to speak of case three. I might say a few words when I'm dealing tomorrow and Friday about on, of uh, exponential sums of a finite field. Because that's one of the key things in this ternary estimate. Okay. Right. So one advantage of writing things in this way is that it's literally the same type of thing that are in the papers of Fouvry, Ivanietz, and Bombier, Friedlander, Ivanietz, except that the C of Q had slightly different kind of control of, uh, of what was going on. But it's exactly the same decomposition uh, because the C of Q takes care of the absolute value. In everything we do, we'll have to be careful about uniformity in A, and I hope you will see at some point where, uh, where this is important. Right, so if we just look at it like that, at the moment nobody has really any idea of how to estimate this non-trivially in this manner with, uh, with no conditions on Q. So we have this condition of being square-free, uh, which is not a problem, and especially to be smooth. So let me explain where the smoothness comes in. So in the fourier vanietz paper, uh, the idea is to create s flexibility. It's always a question of bilinear form is one of the few things we know how to do in analytic number theory. Uh, and so the idea is to create a bilinear form also from the moduli. And so in Ivan Yetz's uh, work on the linear sieve, he had developed uh, a notion of so-called well-factorable function, which basically means that this C is always a convolution with complete flexibility in the ranges. So the idea was that C could be itself written as the sum over Q1 and Q2, where you can fix kind of the range of Q1 and the range of Q2 with complete flexibility. And this is the type of stuff that's useful. So uh, in the cell box sieve, as presented by Sound and, and as used by James, you saw 
the error term uh, comes in uh, with a product of two things. And as I said this morning, uh, this is kind of bilinear, but it's not flexible enough because there's not control of the ranges the way we want. OK, so the C of Q uh, can give flexibility. And so the way we're going to do it, so the way Zhang does it, is to simply write uh, Q as R times S, say. Using the smoothness, you can fix the position of one of these divisors. So let's say that uh, uh, which one is which. Right. So R will be very close to N, but a little bit smaller, minus something very small. So for some small mu and delta 2, strictly positive. So I guess minus delta here, it's the delta. Okay, so because Q is assumed to be X delta smooth uh, and N is less than X, you can kind of find something like that. I guess literally speaking, I should put maybe two delta since N is just of size about squared. But something like this is only true. Okay, and so Q is very close to square root of x, n is also close to square root of x. So altogether, it means that s is a fairly short variable. So we don't need very complicated decomposition in that case. The gain will come just from this small s. So let's say that s is about of size capital S. So r times s uh, is about q, which is about x to the 1. And so s is about, so s is very small. OK, and now this means that we can, in this manner, we need to handle stuff like that. So sum over R, sum over S. So I don't write the ranges. Implicitly, the ranges are always the capital letters associated to this. Then C depends just on the product. And then you have the same condition as above. Minus the meter. So I just repeated this, and we have these two variables. So intuitively, the idea will be to almost not exploit the S average, which is very small. Uh, and so we're going to move the sum over S outside and sum over R. And so there's first some kind of a, so the idea is to view this as a bilinear form in terms of R and S which is often called the dispersion method uh, of Linux. And uh, there's a first step, so it's not quite an equality. So there's a first step, which I don't really have time uh, to give details for. So it's classical in the dispersion method. Uh, it's another way of getting rid of this uh, expected main term. So it uses the ziegel valfish property. So instead of comparing Mn congruent to A modulo Q, and Q, of course, is Rs, uh, alpha and beta n. We're going to compare this with another congruence class. So we want to say that the things are well distributed in congruence classes. Another way of saying that is that uh, if you take in one class minus in another class, it's very small. That's, a way, that's another way of not having to worry about the main term. So this means you need to handle something like that. So it's relatively cosmetic, but it's actually convenient from the technical point of view. Uh, so in the classical dispersion method, there are three sums to handle, uh, one of which is by far the hardest. This allows you to write things up in such a way that uh, only the third hardest part has to be written down. OK, and so the first one, we take mn congruent to a modulo q. Here, yeah, mn is congruent to a modulo r. Sorry, modulo r. But modulo s, we take something that's different. So it's b1 modulo s, and it's b2 modulo s. 
for some uh, B1 and B2. And you have to estimate this uniformly in terms of A, B1, and B2. Okay, so how you go from one to the other is not completely obvious, but I hope that intuitively, uh, if you can handle and say that this is always small, that means that on, in all arithmetic progressions, modulo RS, things are really well distributed. Uh, it's important that it's the same A modulo R. And again, things have to be uniform uh, in terms of uh, A, B1, and B2. So these are integers, and things have to be uniform. OK, so now we view this as a bilinear form. Uh, there are more variables than we are used to, uh, to show in, all, in examples. So there's some flexibility in deciding which variables you consider as the first variable in the bilinear form, and you apply Cauchy-Schwarz, and the other one. So here the idea is to um, get rid of the alpha m. So that means you pull the alpha m in front and apply Cauchy-Schwarz to that one. So we apply Cauchy-Schwarz to the uh, m and uh, s variables. Uh, no, sorry. Ah. So I call sigma the sum. So this means that I'm saying that sigma squared is at most, well, the sum over R of the sum over M alpha M squared. So I put a square so I don't put that. So this you have to think about of, as of size R times M because alpha M uh, despite not knowing much about it, we know it's not big on average, uh, maybe times some powers of log. And then there's the second term, which is sum over R, sum over M, and then the modulus of sum over S, C over RS, times the sum of beta N in the two residue classes. So here, uh, MN is congruent to A, Mn is congruent to A, that's modulo R. And uh, Mn is congruent to B1, modulo S, and congruent to B2. So except for this cosmetic rearrangement, that's just to avoid work uh, in terms of writing the paper, uh, this is exactly the same thing that was done by Fouvry and Ivanet, in at least in one of their papers. Well, you have to look at how it's done. Do you want to check? <laughs> they're just integers. They're just fixed integers. And I don't write, I mean, they're always co-primality condition that whatever is the residue class corresponding here. So R and S are co-prime because Q was square free. And so uh, uh, the residue class modulo Q corresponding to A modulo R and B1 modulo S has to be invertible and so on. What do you mean? No, the, these are just integers. They are fixed. We don't have any control on their size or anything, but the estimates will have to be uniform. That's a congruence class. Yeah, Here? That's MN. What's the question? No, that's a definition. Yeah, yeah. I don't think I used sigma before. So we want to study this sum, and there's some extra step that I'm adding uh, where you need to only handle this sum. These sums are of size mn, and we want to gain still the same powers of logics. More questions? So for those who are interested in Dimitri's question, I think, um, you can look at this sort of difference, and if you average over all 
possible values of B2. I mean, naively, you want to do one A and one B1, and you want to compare to the sum over all ends and all ends and the residue class B RS, which is based on B A. So you can average over B2 to have some have the equivalent equation for um, the average mod S. Then there's this other thing right. that you want to say that this full one A is equal to the average. Right. So Exactly, and so that, that's where the also Ziegelwaldfisch is hidden somewhere in that in that argument. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we're looking at that, and this is kind of the way the first step. So it's just viewing things as a bilinear form, and we get rid of the alpha variable, and we view the R variable also as another one. Like that. So we are left to deal with that thing. So here, if you just estimate everything trivially, uh, it's kind of the, uh, the way the cauchy schwarz inequality works. You've not lost anything yet, but you've not gained anything either. OK, now we continue in the usual manner. So we concentrate on the second expression, and we exchange the sum. So uh, pom, pom, pom. So we expand the square, so there's going to be an S1 and an S2. And then I pull the R and the M. I have to be a bit more careful here. So there'll actually be uh, four terms. So it's not quite equal again. There's a, uh, because when you expand the square of this difference here, there are going to be two different things, and you get sum over n1 and n2, let's say, uh, beta n1, beta n2 conjugate, where, so mn1 is a mod r, mn2 is a mod r, mn1 is b1 mod s1, and mn2 is b2 mod s2. So B1 and B2 are not exactly necessarily the same as before. So more precisely, you would have one thing here with B1, B1, one with B1, B2, one with B2, B1, and one with B2, B2. Do we still agree? Yeah. You can change me if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We have to think about that. <laughs> okay. Right, okay, so that's probably, I mean, it's pretty technical and, and it's certainly not something one remembers easily uh, even after seeing it quite a few times. But here there's this crucial point. So it's already there in the fouvry vanietz ID. Because A is fixed, um, MN1 is A mod R, MN2 is A mod R, so N1 and N2 are not arbitrary. They're actually congruent to something, to the same quantity modulo. Okay, so this is the first it's a completely crucial point uh, in any of these attempts to go beyond uh, exponential distribution one half for such functions. Okay, and this is because A is the same. So if Dimitris's objection earlier had been valid, then it would be already dead. Uh, okay. And the reason this is a nice Condition, remember R is relatively large. I think I wrote it down somewhere, yeah. So N is relatively close to X to the one half, so R is also relatively close to X to the one half. N1 and N2 are of size N, which is also relatively close to X to the one half, but a bit smaller. I mean, a bit bigger, sorry. N is a bit bigger than R. So this congruence condition doesn't leave much room. It leaves a little bit of room for uh, n1 minus n2, but not too much. So the way this is handled is, again, it's already in the very first papers of Fouvry and Ivanietz. We write that n2 is n1 plus a multiple of r, and we uh, consider this multiplying factor as an extra variable, and the average over this extra variable is going to be trivial. Is 
of course. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, there are lots of stuff. I mean, no, here you maybe don't need it, but it, in the actual thing, it is, there, there is preliminary sieve. Yes. Hmm? Okay, you look, look in the text. That's why this text is unreadable. Okay. Anyway. Okay, and so here we see, for instance, if we try to put a maximum over the residue class modulo A, this would not have worked because for every Q we would have a different A, and here we would have some A and some A prime, uh, and so we would not have this congruence condition uh, to make things work. So it's probably worth for you to look back at the proof of bombier rivinogradov and, and see why, why it was possible to put uh, a maximum over the residue class, because a posteriori it looks strange I mean, usually it's hard to sum the maximum of something. Uh, so it's interesting to analyze why it worked uh, in the uh, bombier vinogradov theorem. Okay, so one writes that let's say N2 is N1 plus L times R, and so L is uh, less than N over R, so which is quite small. So the way I wrote it is N to the new, and new you should think of very small. So we will sum, or Uh, the idea is to, now uh, the next step is to sum over L trivially, so for each fixed L, which means that we lost N to the power nu. Okay, because the, the L variable cannot give any cancellation, uh, but nu is very small, so at some point we have, at this point we need to gain a bit more than powers of log uh, for this argument. So uh, the variable is small. The variable L is quite short. So that's why it may make sense. Okay, now we're actually getting close to something that looks like an exponential sum of a finite field. Not quite there, but I can erase the claim. Okay, so we are left with things like uh, sum over R. Well, I guess. Sum over N, sum over N. So I, I renamed this new variable uh, N1 to N again. Uh, so beta N beta of n plus l times r complex conjugate. And we now have summation conditions like mn is congruent to a modulo r, congruent to b1 modulo s1. But now it's m times n plus l times r, that's b2 modulo s2. OK, so what is, the, what is something we've gained here? So we can analyze once again a little bit in an intuitive way, something that's uh, important. And that's somewhat the main target of all this manipulation is to arrive at this new type of situations. So we're going to look at the sum of M and N. So it's of length altogether about X. It's a sum over congruence classes with congruence conditions. What is the modulus? So the length is about x, and the modulus of the congruences well, there's r, there's s1, and there's s2. OK, they might not be coprime. So you Technically, it's really just the greatest common, uh, least common multiple, but very often it's going to be 
RS1, S2, which is about RS squared. So this is quite often. And much of the technicalities in uh, writing up such type of arguments is actually to handle the fact that this is not literally an inequality. An equality, there has to be a common multigrader, common multiple. And uh, so in the first draft of the polymath 8 paper, this was the only place where there was a mistake. So the, the greatest common divisor was not always handled correctly, and this created a, a bunch of uh, painful rewrites. Well, actually, not so painful, but annoying things. So what's the point of that? So this is to compare with originally, so if taking r equals 1, so meaning if you're not using any factorization, the modulus would be much larger than that, so it would be uh, q squared, uh, meaning s squared, uh, yeah, which is about x, and now it's quite a bit smaller. And the gain is that uh, we have trying to deal with sums over residue classes. And then we know that the length of the sum compared to the modulus of the residue class is crucial. And in particular, to get any kind of non-trivial estimates in any kind of robust situation, we need to be able to have a sum whose length is at least the square root of the modulus. So it's a general principle that I'm going to explain now. If you have a sum, uh, of an interval of integers of some function with a residue uh, with this type of congruence condition or just uh, of a function periodic modulo q like these conditions are giving you, uh, you can do it if the length is at least somewhat larger than square root of the modulus in many cases, but if it's smaller, it's really hard. So it's very similar to the polyov uh principle or inequality that Sound explained earlier. So uh, the gain is so we get sums of lengths, so sums modulo uh, this Rs1, S2 of lengths larger than uh, the square root of the modulus. So it's, it's not completely clear yet that things are okay because and we still have to look at this um, beta n and beta n plus LR, which are uh, completely arbitrary a priori, even if they are smooth. So there's still work to be done. Uh, no, sorry. I said, they're, no, they're not smooth, of course. These are obtained by the gluing from the bilinear form. So we actually know nothing except uh, sums on average types. Okay, maybe I go on the other side. So I'm going to state now a lemma, which is a very general type of things that is very useful and is somehow uh, the abstract version of the Polyavinogradov inequality. I guess it was actually Dimitris who talked about Polyavinogradov first. <laughs> okay. So I'm actually going to state some of the version that's not as good as the one Dimitris stated because I'm going to use discrete Fourier analysis instead of actual Fourier series. But uh, to get an idea of what's going on, it's it's just as, uh, as clean. So it's kind of a general Polyavinogradov method. And it says the following. So I'm going to take, so it's the periodic situation. I could deal with a function defined on Z. And, uh, <laughs> it's where? Where is the accent? It's on O? Yeah. OK. I, I do not challenge you. <laughs> OK. So we have some a priori arbitrary function defined modulo q. q is not necessarily a prime. It could be anything. We have some integer between 1 and q. And we want to say something about the sum over uh, the integers, let's say, from 1 to capital N. You could deal with another interval, but that's not very important. And so there's some first statement that's a formula. 
uh, which is in fact somehow a version of isopoisson summation of Planchard formula in a discrete setting. So you look at h mod q, you have some coefficients gamma n of h, which are the Fourier coefficient of the characteristic function of this interval, discrete uh, Fourier coefficients. So 1 over uh, square root of q, sum of e, uh, uh, yes, n h over q from 1 to capital N, and I guess I should put a minus sign somewhere. Let's put it here. And then you have the Fourier transform of k at h with the same normalization that I used yesterday. So 1 over square root of q times the sum of uh, k of n e of n h over q. So that's a formula. It's a bit similar to this Poisson summation formula when you don't try to estimate anything. And the standard estimate one gets from there. is the following. So it's an obvious uh, bound that sometimes is not what you want, but in many cases does work. So the sum is going to be bounded by uh, the sum of the absolute values of the gammas times uh, the supremum norm of the Fourier transform. Okay, and this is not difficult to show, is at most um, square root of Q times the log of 3 times q. Okay, so why do I interpret this as saying that these sums can be estimated non-trivially when n uh, is somewhat larger than square root of q? So it's again because of the usual square root cancellation type expectations. So we assume that k, let's say, is bounded by some absolute constant, let's say one or two. So if uh, absolute value of k is, let's say, less than 10,000, and if there is square root cancellation in all of these sums giving me uh, the Fourier transform, these are all oscillatory sums, let's say there's code cancellation so that this is of size uh, 10 million times square root of q divided by square root of q, that's 10 million. It's a bit more than 10 million. I'm giving myself some room. Then we have a non-trivial bound for n larger than some uh, constant times square root of q log of 3 q. So, uh, let's say 10 to the 10,000. Okay. But if n, let's say, is uh, q to the one fourth, then this estimate is larger than square root of q, the trivial bound is essentially q to the one fourth. It doesn't say us anything. Okay? And there are very, very few cases, uh, and usually it's very important, where people know bounds for special function k when n is strictly less than square root of q, but these are few and far between, and usually the techniques are absolutely not robust. So uh, you can have a function like this where you know something, you perturb it even a very small bit, and, and you just don't know anything. So I'll just maybe mention this. Uh, I don't know if it was mentioned by any of the Others. So uh, there's one very, very important case where one does a bit better. It's a multiplicative character, which are not principal. There's the so-called Burgess bound. Exists and is non-trivial, uh, starting from a little bit more than Q to the one fourth, where delta is arbitrarily small. And when N I mean, the modulus Q is not prime. Sometimes you can use uh, things like so-called uh, Q van der Koppel technique to actually have some kind of somewhat robust uh, approaches to short sums. And actually, this is something that's used in some of the steps uh, in the polymath version of Jean's theorem. So the fact that the modulus that we have to deal with, so uh, there are always 
quite smooth, so you can exploit factorization to get kind of robust versions of uh, improvements to this bound. But for, for prime modulus Q, there's not much you can do at the moment. Okay? So let me see where I'm at. Okay, so I'm almost at the end of the time. Right, and I erased, of course, the... Yeah. Someone should have stopped me from erasing the crucial thing. Okay, so we had something like the following sum. I'll just rewrite it and I'll finish this, say a few more words tomorrow. So we had something like. No, that's not. Sorry. No, sorry. Right, so, so the crucial thing, let's look at the sum over m and n. And you have these congruence conditions, which I'll write quickly. So the sum M has no particular uh, problems to be performed because uh, it's completely smooth. So we uh, perform a Fourier expansion uh, for the sum over M. So sum over M gives you a sum uh, over some H1, let's say, of some coefficients gamma M of H1. Uh, and because it's just a congruence condition, you're going to get some exponential modulo this modulus. So I assume they are co-prime here, RS1, S2. And I'm going to more or less ignore these two other conditions. The crucial thing is that uh, M yeah, A n bar. A and bar H, H1, sorry. Then there's still the sum over N with the coefficients that we don't know and the other variables that I did not write down again. So the next step is to, again, apply some kind of completion technique. So I didn't say, but this general inequality I was writing or the first formula is often called the completion technique. Uh, we want to apply it to the n sum, but we don't know anything about the betas. We cannot really complete them. So we again use the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality to get rid of the unknown coefficients. Uh, and then we get a smooth sum over n, and we perform it. And uh, we get in this manner. So I'll just finish writing this down, and I'll write. I'll, I'll do this maybe in a few minutes at the beginning tomorrow. Again, but just so you see the sums which appear. So yeah, it's not quite literally that, because I, I, I did as if uh, B1 and B2, again, were the same as A, which is not quite the case. But so Cauchy-Schwarz to handle the uh, beta n, beta n plus LR conjugate. And so you end up with sums of the following kind modulo sums over n. So you're going to have the dual variable, which I, maybe I should call H2 of the n variable. So it's something like that. So we had M E I of n. And then the Fourier transform, 
with respect to the end variable of this condition, but after some Cauchy-Schwarz, so it really looks more like E of A n bar H1 minus A n bar H2. So this comes because when I apply Cauchy-Schwarz, n comes outside, and then everything else is multiplied. There are two variables for each of the other ones. This is still, so here now the modulus becomes, the, the R is duplicated, R, L1, L2, S1, S2, S prime 1, S prime 2, and uh, E of UN. Right. Okay, and these are the final exponential sums in the beginning of steps. At least in this treatment, there are other treatments where you arrange the cauchy schwarz differently. So the main point is to get these sums to be small in non-diagonal situations. Okay, because this is applying cauchy schwarz so then we do the usual diagonal, non-diagonal contributions. And here the critical case will be when, uh, so here it's not quite visible, but when uh, all the variables kind of glue in the minimal way and uh, you want to get that this is non-trivial, this is bounded in a non-trivial way when H1 is not H2, and whenever the, uh, the moduli, even when the moduli are the same. So when the moduli are distinct, it's not very surprising that you get cancellation. What is non-obvious is when the moduli are the same. So you should see this as somewhat similar to a cluster ensemble. I mean, it's almost literally a cluster ensemble in this, in this manner, and so it's handled by the same type of technique. So tomorrow I'll start by maybe redoing some of these final steps in a clean way so that you can see this arising, and then I'll state uh, basic facts about exponential sums of finite field that lead to uh, very non-trivial upper bounds for this. Uh, in particular, you typically are going to gain scope of the modulus, which is quite a big gain, uh, and so it's conceivable at least that in some ranges of the bilinear forms, this is sufficient for what you want. Okay, that's all for today. Any questions? Okay.